Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for Thursday, November 12th, 2020. In accordance with the mandated direction of the State Superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel. In order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff, in accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting, despite not being physically present. And that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open, pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act, by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Pastor? Present. Ms. Mann? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Mr. McMillan? Mr. Offerman? Present. Dr. Hager? Thank you, Ms. Cox. We do have a quorum. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Adams? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Perendozzi? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. And we also have staff that are presenting um, Dr. Woolridge? Present. Dr. Um, Zarshan? Present. Dr. Bennett? Present. Dr. Bodison? Present. Dr. Foy? Present. Ms. Wise? Present. Ms. Charles McGowan? McGowan, sorry. Present. Dr. Nieves? Present. And Mr. Stovenauer? Present. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cox. I don't believe there are any others, but just in case, will you see if there are any other people present? I believe that's it. That's it? Thank you, yep. Ms. Cox. All right, Dr. McComas, would you like yes, to get us started? Yes, thank you, Ms. Pasture. Um, our first item on today's agenda are items for approval. Um, our first item is our college and career readiness um, item um, related to equal opportunity schools. Um, this equal opportunity schools is a contract you will see coming forward um, in future board, board and contract committee. Um, and we uh, presented last month and you had follow on questions. And so we're back this month to try to address all those questions and seek approval for this um, resource. Uh, the second uh, item for approval will uh, pertain to athletics. So we'll go ahead and I'll invite uh, Dr. Wistead and Dr. Woolridge to um, present on Equal Opportunity Schools. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. I can bet Mr. Corns is going up the slideshow now. We can go to the next slide. As Dr. McCormick stated, we're back. Um, and I just wanted to give a little refresher about Equal Opportunity Schools and their mission, which is to ensure that all students have the opportunity to succeed in challenging high school courses. Equal Opportunity Schools is an expert in helping school leaders identify and upgrade students who can succeed in advanced placement or international baccalaureate courses, but are not yet enrolled for systemic reasons related to race or socioeconomics. Next slide, please. The services that Equal Opportunity Schools provides are um, staff to support the schools, including a partnership director, a data management specialist, a regional manager of partnerships, uh, a client support specialist, and the software development and professional learning will be a part of the support. I'll keep rolling. It looks like we lost the slideshow. Um, schools will participate in a staff survey as well as a student survey. And there are specialized reports, including data analytics um, that are provided. Next slide, please. To respond to one of your questions, Equal Opportunity Schools had worked with 11 different districts in Maryland, historically, with the oldest partnership entering its fourth year. Those districts are listed for you. Baltimore City, Calvert County, Cecil County, Dorchester County, Howard County, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Queen Anne's County, Talbot County, Washington County, and Wacomico County. In 2016-17, four schools were partnered. Um, in 2017 and 18, 21 schools partnered. In 2018, 19, 33 schools partnered. In 2019, 20, 48 schools partnered. And for this school year, 2020, 2021, there are 52 partnering schools around the state of Maryland. Around the country, there are 16 new districts and 224 historical districts for this school year, 2021 and 2022. Um, and this resulted in 75 new schools and 675 historical schools. Uh, they have partnered with 35 different states in the past, and they are adding two states in this year. Slide, please. We exchanged some data with Equal Opportunity Schools, and they provided this information for us. Um, and this is showing you that there are 38% of our current high school students that are in upper level courses. Next slide, please. This graphic shows you um, all the other districts that Equal Opportunity Schools were partnering with compared to BCPS. We're like that dark gray. You can't really, you know, it's very hard to see kind of right in the middle there. So you see the other districts that they're partnering with. You know, some have already a higher um, participation rate. Some have a lower participation rate. So you can see by this, there's about 30% of students of color and low income participating in upper level courses for BCPS. Next slide, please. To share um, the success they've had in Maryland, Equal Opportunity Schools calculated the total number of students of color and low income in 11th and 12th grades taking at least one AP or IB course in each district and compared it um, to the year prior to Equal Opportunity Schools uh, working with them. So compared to the year before, Equal Opportunity Schools had partnered with Maryland, the State Department of Education. The enrollment of students of color and low income increased by 423 students in that first year, the 2016-17 year. 21 schools showed an increase of 985 different students in the 2017-18 school year, and 33 schools showed an increase of 1,714 students enrolling in upper-level co courses in the 2018-19 school year. The 48 schools that were participating this past year, uh, the Maryland State Department of Education did not have that data yet. Um, in 2018-19, this work equated to 28% of an increase in the number of students of color and low income passing at least one AP or IB course as compared to the 2017-18 school year. Next slide, please. 
Also in Maryland, Equal Opportunity Schools, their partner schools, as they call them, had an 8 to 9% increase of student participation in upper level courses. The non partner schools only saw a 2% increase in the underrepresentation of student participation in the upper level courses during that same time period. Equal Opportunity Schools saw no significant drop in, in achievement. Equal Opportunity School partner schools have seen a 3.7% increase in AP exam pass rate compared to the non-partner schools. An impact of the report that was issued by the Maryland State Department of Education was submitted to you prior to this session, so hopefully you had an opportunity to look at that. I believe that that also may have answered some of the questions you had brought to our attention. Um, the purpose of that report was to inform the State Board of Education on the partnership between all the Maryland public schools and Equal Opportunity Schools, which was, um, which as you know, is a nonprofit organization established in 2010. And their purpose, as I stated earlier, is to increase the participation of low income students and students of color in advanced placement courses. Next slide. To share the success around the country, on average, the Equal Opportunity Partner Schools saw a 30% increase in the total number of underrepresented students passing at least one AP course from year one to year two. So those are first year um, test takers. And they saw little to no drop in the average pass rates or average grades earned in those courses. Since 2014, Equal Opportunity Schools has uh, supported districts and they have enrolled 43,000 underrepresented students in their time across the country. Approximately 75% of the program see no drop in the pass rate or the grades earned. So this shows you um, some other examples. Charlotte Mecklenburg School District saw a 50% increase in the number of underrepresented students taking and passing at least one AP or IB class. Um, Chicago Public Schools saw a 38% increase in the number of underrepresented students taking and passing at least one AP or IB class. And the Lamar Consolidated School District saw nearly a three times increase in the number of students in Latinx students taking and passing AP or IB and four times an increase in the African American students taking um, and passing AP or IB. So um, their average grades earned increased in that time. So with that, we are available for, next slide, additional questions, and hopefully that answered some of the items that you brought up in our last session. I would just like to also add that um, on the board website where it's the link to today's curriculum committee agenda are all these materials and the materials Dr. Wisted referenced around the MSCE uh, report out and um, information uh, that she referenced there as well for all of our board members and then for the public as well. Thank you. Ms. Pastor, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, um, and and I do, you know, I have a few things, but I'm sure and I can't, something is going on with my screen, so I really can't see anything. Can we not have this slide because I can't see anything, so I can't see all of you, and I would, there we are, thank you. Um, so I knew even without being able to see it all that Ms. Mack had her hand up, I just intuitively knew that. Um, and I see Mr. Offerman. So I'm going to wait before I, I respond. And I'm even going to hold back Ms. Mack um, because I really need to defer to her before mine, and that gives her a few more minutes to go through the numbers, all right, because I know you are. So let me go to Mr. Offerman first and then Ms. Mack, please. Mr. Offerman? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions. One, uh, uh, when we when we met last month, my understanding was there were two schools uh, selected for the uh, for the first year of this program. 
and uh, are are they still the same two schools, or, or do we add a, a school that perhaps was had, had a majority of uh, of uh, African American or low income students? If I'm going to let anyone steal my thunder, I will let it be John Offerman. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> Mr. Offerman, we have we have added. We are prepared to add another school. There were in total seven schools that our data identified under representation. We were originally going to start with a pilot of two. We'll start with a pilot of three. But that that isn't a problem. We can we can okay. certainly move forward. Uh, we're hoping to move forward, Seth. And I'm assuming, and this is my dated knowledge of this, that a passing grade on on the uh, on an AP test is is still a three. I think it's uh, I think technically it's a three, but Mr. Opperman, as you know, with your uh, background, that um, colleges tend to up the ante, and so more and more of the colleges are requiring fours or fives before okay. they will consider that as credit. So you know, it ultimately comes down to how does the AP uh, score translate uh, at the college level. What will they give credit for? Okay. And then, and 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 what is the uh, what is the cost of this uh, of this contract? So, well, the contract you'll see a total contract over five years. But um, what happens as far as the individual cost? The Maryland State Department of Education reimburses us. So we put out. Um, $20,000 per school, but Maryland State Department of Education reimburses us $10,000 for each school. Thank you. Sure. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman, Ms. Mack. Um, thank you very much um, for this information. I, I Obviously, I'm talking, so I have some concerns. Um, I'm concerned about the language in some of the slides where we don't talk about um, increase in achievement, but instead we say no significant drop in achievement or little to no drop in average pass rate or average grade earned. Um, that's not a very resounding um, plus for this when we can't talk about increase in achievement and instead talk about little to no drop. It concerns me greatly to see yes. that. So Ms. Mack, just to share with you, remember the their statistics they're showing us is because we are entering children for the first time. So the students that are participating, it's the first time they're ever being asked to participate in an advanced placement course. So they can't show an increase after that first year. The first year, um, the statistics I was sharing with you is you know their pass rate because it's the first time they've ever even been included in an advanced placement class, if that helps. I can well, also, and I also add, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Oh, McConnell. That's OK. I was going to say, I think I can clarify as well, Ms. Mack, because I do understand what your point in, and I appreciate, Dr. was said, your point about first time test takers and even first time students in, in a, a college uh, geared courses. So Ms. Mack, the purpose, there's two pieces here to what you're getting at, right? There's one opening access and getting underrepresented students in those classrooms in the first place. That's the purpose of, of equal opportunity schools. Now, the quality of instruction to get from the past college board, that's that's a separate issue. That really comes down to the professional development and the instructional calibration of the teacher teaching the course. Have they been to the college board workshops? Do they understand what rigor in that course looks like aligned to the college board exam? So that's really a separate piece from EOS. EOS, their purpose is really about opening access and getting underrepresented students who typically in, in traditional processes in schools would people may say, no, they're not prepared to do uh, AP class and they don't even get into the classroom. So I hope I clarified for you. So I, your point around, we not only want to increase access, we want to see achievement rise. I would absolutely agree with you. I just need you to understand this vendor, their what they're working on is the, the opening the door and getting kids in the classroom. What happens instructionally is um, really our work with teachers and our work of with the college board around professional development. I hope that and, helped. And I, no, I want no, to also a, clarify one other piece. So when they're saying no drop, um, you know that that perception of oh we're including um, the students that are underrepresented 
that might drop the overall grades of every student that participates. And what they're telling you is that is not the case. The students enter and the average scores for all the kids that are participating remains the same. It doesn't drop down because you've included these kids that traditionally you were not including previously. I appreciate that additional information. Um, I am a little concerned that I, I didn't know there was an attachment and that's probably a me problem, not a you problem. Um, so I think I'm gonna abstain on this contract, use the time between now and building in contracts to read the information and vote accordingly then. But, and I, and I, I am fully support giving kids access. And I know I'm gonna steal a little bit of Ms. Pasteur's thunder because she often speaks about the fact that when you do include kids in higher level classes, just the exposure itself is beneficial to them. So I, I, I'm very, very aware of that. I want kids to be the best they can be, but I don't feel like I'm prepared to vote on this. So thank you. You're welcome, and thank you, Ms. Mack, and I, I hope that we were able to help um, answer the questions that you have so far. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, with that, after we had that um, conversation at the last meeting, um, I did talk to people that I know on boards of other systems where it is and people who teach in other systems. Um, that have it. And I have to say that for the most part, people had positive responses, but in some cases there were um, some mixed feelings, mainly because of uh, what you just pointed out, Dr. McComas and Dr. Wistead, uh, in responding to Ms. Mack, is that the vendor is about getting students in. Um, and and giving them those opportunities, which clearly is wonderful. And Ms. Mack is correct that I believe, and College Board even says this, that um, the success of young people when they move beyond high school has shown that there is um, a, a better correlation to having the exposure and how they do in school, college, than it is actually what score they got on the test that very often that number doesn't match with their readiness for college, but that explosion certainly does. It gives children a leg up, so that is good. But Dr. McComas, I would like to hear from one of the two or both of you um, just what has been articulated as the commitment for professional, from the system, for the kind of professional development that will be needed to make sure that we're not just putting children in for face value, but not helping them to be successful, because that can have as much of a damaging um, a, a result as not including them in the first place. So the idea is to build them up. So can you just address first what, um, and, and I know you wouldn't be bringing it to us, and then if up, upper management or upper staff, as Dr. Woods said at the last meeting, um, is looking at this, then I, I have to believe that there is some, but can you articulate, either one of you articulate, what kind of uh, support? Sure, sure, so I think we'll attack, attack that question in two parts. So if Dr. Woods said you could talk a little bit about the professional development that is provided by uh, equal Opportunity School to help a school analyze what are their processes, procedures, and the sort of mindsets that go into their current identification process. So that is part one of the professional development, if you will, Ms. Pastor, that really needs to alter, if you will, the culture and process of the school. And then when we talk about the actual instructional calibration, to Ms. Mack's question earlier around how do we not only open the door, but ensure that achievement continues to rise um, for all of our students. That part of professional development really comes down to us helping our teachers participate in college board workshops. The college board workshops are the, um, if you will, the, the primary um, uh, uh, aligned professional learning to the college board exams. And I'm, I'm sure Ms. Pasteur and your background, I know myself as a previous AP teacher, uh, the college board workshops were the absolute best resource for me Absolutely. as a teacher at AP to understand 
the uh, calibration to the College Board exam to understand what rigor looked like in their definition and how my students need to perform against uh, the College Board exam. And so that, that continues to be a, a fundamental professional learning in terms of the instructional piece. So, and how to teach the classes to make sure their success. Yes, so I, I'm a believer in that, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. So Dr. Wistead will talk here about the professional learning that Equal Opportunity School um, provides or does with the schools that are partnering uh, to help, again, analyze their system processes to work on um, culture and climate around, because it really, in many, many cases, comes down to um, beliefs about who, who, who can and be successful in these opportunities. Sure. I mean, you shared a lot, but I will just briefly add that um, kind of the, the the way that their system is set up is they request um, a team to be put together at each high school. And then those are the staff that they work with when they're doing their coaching um, and their meetings where they're planning out the data analysis meetings, the professional learnings. So they really customize for every school based on um, the staff that is part of the team um, for the Equal Opportunity Schools team. And then uh, Dr. Wilders is with me as well. You know, a central office staff member is also gonna be partnered with each school that's gonna participate. Um, and then she can share with you the additional professional learning that we offer just in BC Pass in general, um, but which could be customized since we're going to be a part of the coaching and professional learning that's happening with these with the vendor. Yes, I'm so pleased to be able to share that we have a series of culturally relevant teaching professional learning workshops for specifically for teachers of, of courses of rigor. Um, so we're talking eight advanced placement, IB, even our GT and advanced academics. There are a series of workshops um, that address parent misconceptions that address um, respecting student experiences and bringing them into the classroom and helping them to um, connect with each other. So a series of those. We also have a second series um, specifically to um, address this current need, but also our COVID need for support for rigorous courses in a digital environment. So we also have a series of workshops specifically um, tailored for courses, teachers of courses of rigor around digital teaching and learning. Um, and so both of those um, are additions to our regular workshops that we offer for um, supporting students and teachers in courses of rigor. Thank you. All right, um, that being said, and I, I do hope that um, Ms. Mack that you um, were able to hear what they said um, because I think it filled in some gaps that I knew would concern you. They concern me as well, and and certainly Mr. Osman um, addressed that. And that is that we're filling in all gaps, not just looking at numbers and saying there's no ch there's no change because that really means absolutely nothing to why we, in terms of why we're putting them in. And because we're at three schools, I'm just going to be of the mind that that third school is um, a school that is made pre up predominantly of African-American children. Now, with that, I want to just go back and just point out, just in case it was missed and just in case there's any sort of pushback, particularly about money, why that is important. Because I think Dr. Wistead, I believe you were the one who said it, I didn't write it there, but you, it, the words were customize the work at each school. Therefore, we know that the schools must be different if we are going to help our population grow. I think I said that incorrectly. But in other words, Catonsville, the schools that were named last time, would not be able to necessarily transfer their experiences to a Milford Mill, for example, because they are on the list. So they couldn't nicely transfer that. So that would not be um, a good conversation. That would not even be a conversation. It would be a talking heads piece. 
So now what we have is real conversation going on where everyone, am I right? I'm, I'm saying all of this off of my head, trying to see whether you're going to say yay or nay, because that will tell me how I will vote. But if now we're having dialogue where the one of the schools is able to say to another one of the schools, this is how our experiences are the same. These are the ways our experiences are different and able to spread that out among all of our schools, whether it's, it's about economics or race. Now, am I on the right path or not? Am I in they some other conversation? They have separate professional learning. So like the Catonsville team is works with the district partner as well as the Equal Opportunity Schools partner, and they have their own set of meetings. Then there are separate meetings with a different school. So yes, it is customized because each school has, um, even though their data may look similar that they're underrepresented, there are different reasons. So like the um, data dialogue and that root cause analysis is a big piece at, to start out with each school because they have different reasons why they are on the list, you know, as you stated. Okay. What I would, would uh -huh. share as well is you, this is not like a one-size-fits-all, train the trainer, and then that's not what this model is. This model is really, as Dr. Wistan was just discussing, it's you have to work with the schools themselves and work through their processes and work with their staff. And then, again, equal opportunity um, is a designed to um, not be there forever. It's really they come in, they do that work to help the school do the self-analysis and make adjustments within the school, um, which, as you were saying, is not the same for one school as necessarily for another. So it, I just wanted to clarify, it's not a one size fits all train the trainer. What is similar is the process they work through, right? Because you're going to look at what are your processes in your school? How is it that we decide who who is eligible for access to advanced placement? Uh, classes like backwards map, how, how does it come to be that, you know, Dr. Adams is able to get access and Dr. McComas is not, right? And so what's the difference there and how do we as a school community um, uh, analyze that, understand that, um, and build um, supports to maybe give Dr. McComas a chance? That maybe she's a, a child who typically would say, no, she's not ready to perform at that level. Um, how do we then say, let's get her in the door and work with her to make sure that she is successful. Because as you know, the research does show that students who even just have exposure to accelerated coursework, they are better in the long range in terms of college admission and college persistence. Um, so. I, I appreciate this. Um, and I appreciate it because it does speak to the integrity because I remember Dr. Hager asking um, why would we pay a company this when we have people who can do it? And I'm just going to put right out here that that piece, take out why would we pay? I know that as I look at this crew, that would be you, that we have people who can do this. But sometimes we're so close on a pro problem that it takes someone from outside to say, mm, maybe you might want to think about tweaking this or seeing something. Because as Ms. Max says, the numbers keep looking the same. And we all keep saying that. They keep looking the same. So I, I, I get a different feel about bringing someone else in. Not that you're not capable, because I know you are, but because it takes, it takes that village, if you will. Um, people seeing things from um, different angles. And I just wanted to ask all of these questions because I did want to understand why we would be paying this amount of money to each school just for them to show somebody how to um, select children to go in. But sometimes that's not as easy as we think, even in predominantly African American schools. Okay. Um, I'm good. I think I saw Dr. Woolbridge's hand up. 
I'm and Ms. Sorry, Pasteur, I was just I, for the chat box. I put it right back down. I apologize. Oh, okay, Ms. Mack. Um, I have three quick questions. In, in this whole conversation, can you tell, say again, Dr. Wisted, who are the targeted groups of students specifically? So they, they target um, students that are typically underrepresented and low income. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to hear race, the low income piece. Okay, race so and socioeconomic both. Okay, and how um, Dr. Um, McComish just said something about they don't stay forever. How long do they typically stay in a school? Well, so um, I don't have the specifics on how long they've been partnered with a specific school, but what they share with us is, you know, their whole go goal is to work themselves out of a job. So. Um, even if they are intense with us, say, for the first year or two, then we could step it down to like a consultative type of situation. They, again, customize that based on the metrics and, and what's happening and the support needs of the district. And then my last question is, how long does the 50% subsidy from MSDE last? So we have not been told that that's gone away. That's been in place for at least the last four years, and we are not aware of that being removed at this time. So we're going into this assuming that for the 20000 per school, we are only paying 10000 Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Year. I still need more information, so I'm still going to abstain, but thank you for answering my questions. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Is the Offerman anything else uh, that might be really immediate and helpful? Go ahead. Uh, no, I'm. I will. Uh, I will send. I will send an an email in with uh, with my uh, my uh, my additional uh, questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Tell me what we're talking about in terms of uh, this timeline, because Ms. Mack is looking at abstaining. Mr. Offerman has other questions. I, it, he didn't articulate what that means in terms of his vote. So what are we talking about here? Well, we were looking at this contract coming forward in the December contracts uh, committee. So that's that's really our timeline at this point. Um, as you know, contracts can move. Uh, things can move forward, and and we'll, you'll be able to say. I know Miss Max on the contracts with me. She'll be able to say this was reviewed at, at the curriculum committee, and this is uh, how the vote um, was identified. We had so many abstain. We had so many support. We had so many nays, um, and then the contracts committee can discuss that. And then, of course, as you know, uh, then the full board has an opportunity to discuss it as well. Yeah. What I what I do want to see happen, though, just in that process, is that Ms. Mack is feeling good or not good about the answers to her question. Mr. Offerman has his. I'd hate it to go to contracts and we have to go through this there. Mm -hmm. We have to be there and speak to new information. So I guess where I'm going is uh, what do you see as a timeline for when Ms. Mack and Mr. Offman and possibly I will have some, Dr. Hager will have some, get our questions in so we don't have to do this. Oh, I see. I see your question. Um, well, um, let's see. If you can get us questions within the week, then we'll be happy to respond. And I'll certainly work uh, with Dr. Williams through the process of response I just ask that, of course, you include Dr. Williams and Ms. Gover on your questions so that uh, everyone's in the appropriate protocol. Okay. The contract meeting is December 8th, so yes. you are aware yes. of that. Okay. Yeah. I, I just don't want us to spend or them to spend this much time at contracts. If we can come in, and I think Ms. Mack, Mr. Offerman, and I, even if we're there, Ms. Mack is a part of that committee. Is that right, Ms. Mack? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, Mr. McMillian as well. Exactly. Then Ms. Pasteur, can I just clarify something? That. Yes, ma'am. Once I have time to read what was provided, and I apologize, I didn't see, I still don't see it. I was trying to find it and read it and, and be ready to go. Um, I can indicate to the team whether I have any other problems. And okay. it, it would be a moot point at, at that point with building in contracts 
I just need to have some questions answered by reading the document. Sure, okay. and Ms. Mack, I'm, I'm happy maybe at the end if, if I can help you navigate to where it is all publicly posted. Thank okay. you. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I won't prolong this in building and contracts. I just want you all to, to assure you all of that. I just have some questions that I'm hoping are the answers are included in that document. Sure. Thank you. And we and as I said, Mr. O or he said, Mr. Offerman has questions as well. And so I would like us to do what um, with this? Hmm. Um, because Mr. Offerman, I get a sense that you're not ready to vote or you would abstain or uh, I I right now uh, I'm I'm okay voting for it at 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 this time, uh, but but I uh, I would like if uh, Dr. McComas could send me the directions to get the additional uh, data. I would I would certainly like that, regardless. Absolutely. Maybe what we can do is at the end I will um, send you an invite, and I'll just now I'll teach you over a Teams meeting how to access that. Thanks. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I'll just send it to everyone. Bye. All right. Um, with that said, and because we do have a quorum, did anyone else enter Ms. Cox, Mr. McMillian, or Mr. Mahomsa? Okay. Um, then let, we'll go ahead and take this vote and then get in the information that we have. Um, because, again, the Contracts Committee has to hear it and vote. And so even if we decide down the road that this was the, not how we were seeing it today, depending on the way the vote goes, uh, yay or nay, we can work with that. Would you agree, Dr. McComas, Dr. Wistad? That that works for us. Again, remember, our, our, our purpose of Curriculum Committee is to say, does this fit an instructional need? Yes. Do we have a need for a resource that helps us um, disrupt our disproportional representation in an accelerated courses at the high school sure. level? So I, I think Ms. that Mac that's always, we come back to like the purpose of our committee is to determine if needs an instructional need. Ms. Mack, is that good for you since you are on that committee? That we'll oh, go absolutely. ahead and vote now. And, 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 we'll and I presume that it would pass. I, I, I guess I was presuming Mr. Offerman was going to vote for it. Um, and that way it comes to the b uh, building and contracts with the endorsement. Um, I just, I need more information. No, so that makes good sense. No. Um, Dr. McComas, uh, I know which schools were on the list. Can you tell us which um, predominantly African-American one we're looking at? Or are you not ready to say that? Well, we, I, I think we're not ready, but we, because we are in the process of working with the school, I don't want to say okay. until I have an opportunity to speak with uh, principal um, okay. and um, meet with the executive director in a community soup. I have had preliminary conversation about which school, uh, but again, out of courtesy to those particular leaders. And again, that's really, it's not difficult. We just, we, we recognize that our board likes to pilot programs, bring back the evidence of the pilot being worth additional investment. And so out of seven schools, we originally picked two expanding the pilot to three, that's fine. We'll be able to just bring back, um, here's how the pilot worked for three schools, and then we would be able to decide, do we want to move forward and offer this um, partnership to additional schools or not? And so that's really, we, we picked two out of seven as we thought would be an appropriate uh, pilot size, um, but so three, now three is fine the as well. The motion, and we see that the State Department, I just wanted to throw that in, that MSD is obviously supporting this yes. program. Okay, so it, uh, for the motion, we're looking at three schools that will be in, that we will bring in three schools for this pilot with equal opportunity. Schools. Well, the motion is for the, the vendor. We are proposing that we do the pilot with three schools. So I don't know that the okay. number of schools for our purposes and curriculum committee is here or I there. I just want it said out loud because I don't want to be un I, I can be so unpleasant and I apologize for being unpleasant last yeah. time and I just don't want to be unpleasant. Okay, so we know that we're looking at three schools. This yes, is just I will about pilot accepting three schools. The, vendor, the contract for the vendor. Yes, if this moves all the way forward and we do get approval to actually uh, contract, uh, you know, 
then I will, I definitely commit to three and I commit to one certainly being predominantly African American. And the vent, but you will have to amend the contract because right now, just in terms of cost, it's only speaking for two. No, ma'am. No, uh, and, and forgive me, I'll just do a quick um, tutorial on contract. So remember when we bring a contract exhibit forward, we typically do the exhibit for a projection of over five years. Correct. Now remember, while we will say, let's say, let's say over five years, we are thinking maybe we want to do this with all seven schools. So that would be a contract for 140,000 over gotcha. five years. Okay. Right? But at any time we can say, no, we decided we didn't, we didn't get the results we wanted from the pilot. We're not going to move forward. We're not. I have obligated. it now. I wasn't okay. seeing that whole picture, that whole yes. five years. I'm thinking three schools, but we're right. looking You're thinking one step at a time. Got it. All right, can I get Ms. Past Chair, wait one yes. I have one more question. I'm sorry, because okay. I am now concerned that we're only looking at seven schools. You know, I look at data every day, know, all day. I and I can tell you there are more than seven high schools that need this type of assistance. So okay. I don't want to belabor this, but if you could email me as to why you picked the seven schools and why you didn't pick more schools as yeah. the potential target schools that would help increase my um, learning also because so the numbers I look at say that maybe there there could be 18 schools that need this and I oh. want to know why we limited it to seven. Yeah so, so we can very so quickly can, answer that. Yeah so just to clarify the seven schools is what equal opportunity schools initially recommended to us based on the numbers. The way the contract, and I'd have to go back and to understand the details of it, but we built in that more than those seven schools over time um, could be engaged with this vendor within the five years. Okay, thank you for that. You don't need to send me an email. Thank you. This is Pollock. Mr. Offerman, did you have a final question? Um, yes, I'm assuming that if this goes well, or very well, that mm -hmm. we could bring forth an we can bring forth uh, a uh, a request to actually uh, to uh, to Amen. increase this contract and 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 include as many schools you know or a, a, a larger number of schools. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And just as you're familiar with contracts, we are always able to um, amend them. Uh, to expand them or extend them or renew them. So that would be just a part of our normal contracts procedures that you, you see in contract committee and the full board. But so this is you. our pilot attempt. This is our yeah, pilot program. Yes, because I know, again, you know, tradition, traditionally our board has asked, let's, let's see this, let's analyze the results before we go whole hog, if you will. And so we were trying to honor that um, cultural expectation among our board. Okay, thank you. Can I get a motion to uh, a motion to approve this contract with Equal Opportunity Schools? So moved. Can I second? Are you yeah, second you it, Cheryl? Uh, no, you second it. Second. <laughs> okay, um, Ms. Mack. No, abstain. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Bastula. Yes. Did anyone else come online? Mr. Mahomes or Mr. McMillian? Okay, so we will carry it to contracts. Ms. Mrs. Mack is on that, um, so is Mr. McMillian, and I will be there as well. Thank you, thank you folks for a really uh, great presentation, adding in things and clearly listening to our concerns. Absolutely. As you know, I believe deeply my job is to make sure that you, you are informed board members and fully understand how things fit together. So it's really their pleasure to, to engage in a conversation. I do want to um, just make um, a, a, a time check. It is 324. We do have one more item for approval. Um, and I am going to sadly ask Mr. Stubenauer if we can move the brain pop again. <laughs> to uh, the next agenda, just because we simply won't get through that. And that was a demonstration of a resource. It wasn't a decision item. It, so, it's just fine, no problem. <laughs> and can you please, please, please put him first next? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and we love you, we really do. We just like you to keep coming to our meetings.
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your flexibility, Mr. Stobenauer. Um, yeah. Okay, if I could have Dr. Adams come forward. He, our next item is also an approval item. It is related to our athletics program. Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, Ms. Mack, Ms. Pasteur, Mr. Offerman. It's so good to be with you all again. Um, I am back with um, supplies and equipment, which would which should seem familiar to you as I review the information. In May, you may recall that um, I, on behalf of myself and Ms. Shea, because we share some contracts between the offices of athletics and physical education and health, came to you and asked for you to extend, at the time, what were two contracts, um, JNI 79414 interscholastic um, athletic supplies and equipment, and JNI 79614, physical education instruction supplies and equipment. You may recall that we asked you to um, provide us the ability to extend those contracts because of the onset of the pandemic, um, the closure of athletic and fitness um, facilities across the nation, which subsequently um, resulted in a mass increase in pricing for the equipment. We believe that extending our then current pricing in May of this year would best position the um, school system to be judicious stewards of the taxpayers' money. And so when we extended, we always intended to go back to bid for the for the supplies and equipment when the market settled down. And so we've worked across the two offices with the Department of Purchasing, and we will be bringing forth at the December meeting a unified contract that will cover all of the items that the Office of Athletics, the Office of Physical Education and Health, and schools were able to purchase with these two contracts prior. Again, it makes more sense to us over time, and we've heard from you all over time that whenever possible, if we could lump similar things into one list of materials and supplies and give you one um, procurement request that would be best. And so what is it that this contract allows us to purchase? Again, I said it is shared between the offices of health and phys ed and um, the office of athletics. And these are purchases that can be made either centrally by the offices or schools can purchase independently on their own to replenish stock. And so some examples include uh, tennis tables, badminton nets, and games at all levels of school. At our high schools, as you know, we have um, exercise equipment to include weight equipment and cardio equipment. We use this to um, replace those equipment as they become um, old and no longer able to be serviced. Mats and movement equipment, you may have seen. I know when I was an adaptive phys ed um, teaching assistant, we used to love to have the students on the little yellow scooters and play games um, scooting along the gym floor. So mats and movement equipment such as that. And then if we think about our um, interscholastic programs at middle and high school, this contract does is the mechanism by which either um, Mr. Sai or individual middle schools and high schools can purchase or replenish sporting equipment on an ongoing basis, basis. You know, you lose so many softballs, you need new mitts, you need extra footballs or soccer balls, um, et cetera. And so um, what I would ask your permission for is um, to be able to bring forward a new contract to merge the two existing um, extensions to enable us to buy this equipment and supplies. And with that, I'll take any questions any members might have. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Yes, any questions? And again, I can't see so if your hand is up just identify yourself and speak please there's no hands raised right now miss pasture thank you does this mean i get to have cake because you didn't have any questions <laughs> okay <laughs> we, we get to take a vote and then we can cake invite our and, colleagues to and no more time there you go thank yes, you dr adams all righty then may i have a motion oh here we are um may i have a motion on this also came to the agenda. Tell me what the item is. Will you read the formal? It's um, athletic and physical education 
supplies and equipment, I believe. I, I, I closed my screen. Okay. Right. All I have are numbers. Athletic and physical education supplies, JNI 794.14, and the comparable one, um, 16, which were combined. Yes, ma'am. So moved, Matt. Thank Second. you, Ms. Mack. Second, Second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, Ms. Mack, your vote. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Bastua? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for... Ask for our athletic equipment. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. So we are finally at our next agenda item, which we're excited because our colleagues have are joining us today from the School Psychology Office and the Division of School Climate and uh, Safety. Uh, we have Dr. Zarchin and his team here today, um, and they will be providing, you know, we like to provide you informative presentations so that you understand the depth and breadth of all that we do for our children to be successful. And so I'm gonna invite, um, Dr. Zarchin's team to come forward, uh, Dr. Bennett, Dr. Bodison, Dr. Foy, Ms. Wise, and um, Ms. Heather, and um, Mr. McGowan, I believe I'm getting the title for that. Thank you. Thank you. Great afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity. Ms. Pasteur, Mr. Mack, I mean, I'm sorry, Ms. Mack and Mr. Offerman. I am especially grateful to Dr. Nieves and Dr. McComas for encouraging and supporting the opportunity for the Office of Psychological Services to present to the Curriculum Committee. It is with great pleasure and enthusiasm that during National School Psychology Week, I introduce four members of the OPS community who join us today to share how BCPS school psychologists continue to support students, schools, and families, even during the pandemic. Today, we have Dr. Preston Bodison, Dr. Josh Foy, Ms. Heather Charles McGowan, and Ms. Carol Wise, who all come with a variety of experience based on the diversity of schools they service within BCPS. For example, Dr. Preston Bodison has been a school psychologist with BCPS for 24 years and is assigned to the Rosedale Center and the Crossroads Center, primarily working with the middle school age population. Dr. Bodison is an active member of the OPS Racial Equity Work Group and Leadership Corps. He is also a member, he is also a team leader for the Traumatic Loss Team. Dr. Josh Foy has been a school psychologist with BCPS for four years and is assigned to Edgemere and Dundalk Elementary Schools. Dr. Foy also provides services to our Southeast area birth to five population and serves as a supervisor to school psychology trainees completing their practical and internship experiences. Ms. Heather Charles McGowan has been a school psychologist with BCPS for nine years and is currently assigned to, to, to Chesapeake High School in Battle Grove Elementary School. Ms. Charles is also a member of the OPS Leadership Corps. Ms. Carol Wise has been a school psychologist with BCPS for 25 years and has been serving our birth to five children and families and child find in the Southeast and Northeast areas. Now we will hear from Dr. Foy, who will share an overview of the school psychologist role. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as a profession, school psychologists fall under the guiding principles of the National Association of School Psychologists. As you can see from the NAS practice model on the screen, we have a number of overarching principles of practice that are followed up by more specific knowledge, skills, and expertise in each area. Strong components of the school psychologist's role are rooted in consultation and collaboration, database decision-making, and accountability. In fact, one of the mantras of school psychologists is show me the data. Next slide, please. So who are we? We are not just assessors, as it may seem. We are collaborative partners. Most people associate testing with the role of the school psychologist. And while that is an important role, it's not our only role. We also are involved with interventions and instructional support to develop academic skills and intervention and mental health services to develop social skills and life skills. 
More importantly, according to the National Association of School Psychologists, the role of the school psychologist should be involved in systems level services, such as contributing to school-wide practices to promote learning, prevention and responsive services, and family school collaboration services. Next slide, please. Our superintendent, Dr. Darrell Williams, has made it clear through the creation of the Compass and other communications that one of his areas of focus is the achievement of all students by raising the bar and closing the gaps. The role of the school psychologist directly aligns with this focus and as collaborative partners with our schools, the school system, and community providers, we use our knowledge and expertise to assist in raising the bar and closing the gaps. Throughout the course of this presentation, you're gonna hear some specific roles that we school psychologists engage in to support our students in our schools. Now I'll turn it over to Ms. Heather Charles McGowan to share some of those specific roles. Next slide, please. So what do school psychologists do? School psychologists apply expertise in mental health, learning, and behavior to help children and youth succeed academically, socially, behaviorally, and emotionally. The ways in which we do so is through providing assessment, consultation, prevention, and intervention services to students, teachers, families, and other professionals in order to create safe, healthy, and supportive learning environments. Overall, school psychologists are collaborative partners. While we may be the only school psychologist in the building or across multiple buildings, we are constantly collaborating with administrators, teachers, families, and community partners to address the needs of those we serve. We collaborate with teachers on how to support academic and social, emotional, and behavioral needs of students, how to optimize the learning environment, and how to support classroom management. We collaborate with school administrators regarding strategies to improve school-wide policies and practice, or strategies to tackle high absenteeism rate or discipline and suspension rates. We also collaborate with community providers to coordinate services for students. Next slide, slide please. Although we primarily fall under focus area two as an office within Division of School Climate and Safety, school psychologists also contribute substantially to focus area one, learning, accountability, and results. In our efforts to ensure all students have equitable access to rigorous, high quality, and highly effective instruction, we provide expertise regarding diverse learners, we contribute to building a stronger professional learning community, we attend and engage in professional learning to stay abreast of current practices in order to inform schools accordingly, we provide consultation to teachers, school administration, parents, and families, we participate in a variety of team and problem-solving meetings, and we conduct, conduct psychological assessments. Next slide, slide, please. In order to help provide a safe, orderly, and caring environment for our students and staff, we provide and support social-emotional learning, both in individual and group counseling, as well as in the classroom setting, we reinforce and provide training in restorative practices. We utilize trauma-informed practices to guide our roles in supporting social-emotional well-being, and we promote equitable practices across schools. Additionally, with the support of Division of School Climate and Safety Leadership, OPS has taken the lead with putting together a council of diverse stakeholders who have collaboratively worked toward a systemic approach to behavior planning. The work on this systematic plan, titled The Resource Guide to Developing a School-Wide Positive Behavior Plan, was led from within OPS with a number of collaborative partners and stakeholders. A template to the resource guide was developed, and we are currently finalizing the resource guide as a companion to developing a positive behavior planning guide. Next, we will hear from Dr. Preston Bodison regarding racial equity work group's efforts. Next slide, please. Uh, the following points chronicle OPS's uh, endeavors to address equitable psychological practices for school uh, BCPS students and their families. Now, this is the ordering of professional development our school psychologists have received. Now, as confirmed by the National Center for Educational Statistics, we reviewed the national rates of disproportionate racial and gender-wise 
of student identification for ID, intellectual disability, and ED, emotional disability. Now, we discussed modifying assessment techniques for the consideration of ID identification. This includes the bolstering of developmental histories and the option of using a condensed adaptive behavioral skills checklist as an observational aid for school psychologists to objectively determine adaptive functioning among referred students. Now, the consideration of alternative coding of 08 other health impaired, 09 specific learning disability, or 504 plan services when warranted was explored. Now, to assist with the consideration of ED identification, OPS collectively gauged the type and scope of prominent instruments and techniques used for assessments. The emphasis, however, is always on obtaining uh, mutually confirming data from multiple sources. Environmental factors such as discrimination, economic disadvantages, and violence may also influence the presentation of ED-like symptoms in the school setting. And once again, the consideration of alternative coding for 08, 09, or 504 plan services when warranted was explored. Now, a specialized session introducing the brain architecture experience, first within OPS, um, the OPS community, and then um, eventually several psychologists facilitated during principal professional learning sessions, and then subsequently facilitated with school staff at principal's requests. And essentially, uh, the brain architecture experience highlighted the relationship between early adverse childhood experiences and the developing brain. Next slide, please. Now, another PD opportunity introduced trauma-informed considerations for conducting assessments with an equity focus. There were also items for teams to consider and develop meaningful interventions for students, trauma survivors. During that session, trauma-informed considerations during the age of COVID-19, including global, national, and local trends, in addition to interventions <laughs> being shared. The next PD opportunity was more experiential in nature, encouraging school psychologists to recognize the significance of cultural identity and awareness, not only for oneself, but for BCPS students and their families as well. And most recently, OPS explored the roles implicit bias and systemic racism have and continue to play in the underperformance of students of color in our school district. Implications for equitable psychological practices to counter racism were also presented. Now, many school psychologists have actively sought to apply skills learned during our PDs into the schoolhouse, and I can provide two personal examples. At the Crossroads Center, at uh, the beginning of last school year, the social worker and I facilitated the brain architecture experience with staff. The feedback we received indicated that the experience was both enjoyable yet impactful. Now, much discussion was generated from this. And then secondly, I used selective parts from the second to last racial equity work group presentation for an experiential session on implicit bias with the Crossroads Center Equity Committee. And that included the principal, who's a member of that committee. I was at a time which I reminded them of, yet they wanted me to finish. And subsequently, uh, I rolled that out with the rest of the uh, Crossroads Center staff, the presentation on the 28th of October. Now, next, Dr. Boyd will highlight evidence-based supports that school psychologists offer. Next slide, please. So does it still seem like school psychologists are just assessors? School psychologists have a full and well-equipped toolbox. We have some areas of knowledge and expertise that align with other roles, such as our amazing school counselors and school social workers, but we also have unique knowledge and expertise to provide as collaborative partners with students, families, schools, and community partners. While the evaluations we conduct are an essential component of our role as it helps to determine eligibility for accommodations and specially designed instruction and to identify the most appropriate and effective interventions, services, and supports for students, we're able to affect change from many more students to other roles that we, pre that we previously mentioned. If a school psychologist assesses one student, then we've been able to help that one student. However, if a school psychologist collaborates with a teacher on how to address the academic or behavioral challenges of a student, we could potentially impact a group of students, the teacher's entire class, and even the teacher's future classes. This is the key distinction between the assessment role and a consultative and a collaborative role. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, most of you might associate school psychologists with being testers. Actually, as the data shows, most of our cases come from consultation with intervention coming in second. It is important to note that while 6% of our cases are assessments, 
These assessments take up the majority of our time due to the inherent complexity of psychological testing and interpretation. For one case, it could take approximately eight to 10 hours for one assessment to be completed for a student, which includes the review of records, meetings, observations, standardized assessments, and writing of the report. So what does all this mean? From the information I just shared, it makes sense that people would assume school psychologists are just assessors. However, we have the expertise and a strong desire to utilize all of the tools in our toolbox and to, ens to ensure that we maximize the impact we have on our students. Next slide, please. In addition to the comprehensive roles that we described earlier in the presentation, there are other targeted supports that psychologists provide beyond the traditional school setting such as autism waiver, home and hospital instruction, special schools and alternative schools, um, non-public assessments, um, traumatic loss team. We also serve as PBIS coaches, um, and as well as the birth to five and infants and toddlers and child find teams. For today's presentation, we wanted to highlight our birth to five program and the school psychologist role within this setting. Therefore, I'll, I'll turn the attention to Ms. Carol Wise, who was one of our birth to five school psychologists. Next slide, please. Carol, you may be muted. Thank you. Start again. So I will be sharing information about birth to five services, and then I will discuss how psychologists support these programs. The so early intervention services are provided for eligible children ages birth through five years of age in Baltimore County. And the focus of birth to five is twofold. The first is to empower families to support their child's development. Parents are their child's first teacher, and we provide detailed information regarding the child's specific strengths and needs as well as strategies to promote their development. The second focus is to support parents as they develop connections with their child's home school and also engage in partnerships with their school communities. The overarching goal of Birth to Five Services is for every child to experience learning and social success and to enter kindergarten ready to learn. Next slide, please. So Birth to Five Services is comprised of two programs. Infant and Toddler serves children birth through three, through three years of age. And in Baltimore County, there are five infant and toddler sites. Young children are eligible for services if they are exhibiting a 25% delay in their development. They have a diagnosed condition that will likely result in a developmental delay, for example, Down syndrome or if they are exhibiting behaviors considered atypical for their chronological age. And then the Child Find Assessment Center serves children three to five years of age who are not enrolled in school and are suspected of having an educational disability. And in Baltimore County, there are four assessment center sites. So parents make the initial referral to both of these programs, and then they work collaboratively with staff to determine their child's eligibility for specialized services. And there are school psychologists assigned to each of the infant and toddler and assessment center sites. Next slide, please. So birth to five school psychologists, we provide a wide range of services. We consult with parents regarding early childhood development, especially as, especially as it relates to the acquisition of milestones. Consultation also occurs when there are concerns regarding a child's behavioral patterns and when needed, a targeted plan to reduce incidences of problem, problematic behaviors is developed. We collaborate with the early intervention teams to ensure delivery of comprehensive services for our youngest learners. We conduct observations of children attending community daycare programs, community preschool settings, and the Head Start centers. And we provide resources to staff in these settings that help promote a child's learning and social success. We organize and establish parent support groups, oftentimes geared toward families that have young children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. We complete psychological assessments, 
and we also attend eligibility meetings and contribute to the development of a child's initial IEP. So I'm going to turn it over to Heather. At this point, we are concluding our presentation. We want to thank the curriculum committee for having us this afternoon. Please allow us to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I, um, Dr. McComas, thanks for adding uh, them. And I, I, want, I, I want to thank uh, the people in this office any school administrator who thinks that this office is just about assessment is not doing his or her work. I'm getting ready to cry. Wait a minute. I can give anecdotes from both of the schools where I was a principal, where people from this office literally saved children's lives, and the lives of others. And those stories will stay with me forever. And the phone calls I made late at night for folks to get on board and save children. So that's all I want to say is just thank you. Anyone else have a question or comment? Go ahead, Mr. Offerman. Uh, yes. Uh, how many school psychologists do we have currently? Hi. We have 107 bodies, but all of them are not full time. We have um, 91 who are 12 month and 16 who are uh, 10 month. And I may be off a few numbers. I don't have the data right in front of me. But in terms of the number of people, it's 107 plus trainees, interns who are um, contractual employees. Okay. And 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 uh, how is their how is their caseload determined? In other words, that that's you know, I, I see a lot of complex issues, and particularly coming now out of this out of this period, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm very concerned about that. As I am as well. Thank you for the question. Um, this is something that we have been working on for years, um, moving toward more equitable assignments. Um, we do our best. The, the overall goal is to make certain that every single school and center has coverage, meaning a psychologist assigned. That's not always ideal because the needs of the school do not always match the FTE. But my, my main goal is to make sure that every single school has a designated professional from the office of, um, from the OPS community um, that can cover the services. So to answer your question, the, the way in which the assignments work are almost as complex as the role itself. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Do we ever use contract uh, psychologists, particularly particularly uh, in terms of testing? Absolutely. We are uh, have a contract. It's a five to 10 year contract. I think we upped it um, recently, but we have seven vendors, contractual vendors um, that are able to do assessments. At this time, only three are willing to do face-to-face -face assessments. So we are doing everything that we can to meet the legal mandates um, because we also have members of the OPS community who are volunteering to help out with their colleagues and take face-to-face um, -face assessments um, if others are having some sort of uh, obstacles that, that, that preclude them from doing so. So, yes, we do have contractual vendors to do assessments. And, and, and are there any, uh, any school psychologist positions open at this time in oh, yes. UCPS? Yes. And and is there a is there a pool of people who are available who who may be interested or or like some of our teaching areas, you know, we, we have a shortage. There's a shortage across the nation. Um, and so we have an open post and even on my signature line and others, uh, we, we try to advertise, do our best to advertise. But there's a there's a shortage across the nation. 
So we are we are openly, you know, advertising and posting, but we have not received any information about new applicants since the start of this school year. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Pastier, I do have a question. Ms. Mack. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the presentation. Um, I represented three children in the foster care system for many, many years and um, was always in meetings with psychologists. Um, and I know the role that psychologists um, played in the outcomes of those children's lives. So I applaud you and I thank you for the information. Um, I'm looking at a slide that I um, created last year to argue for resources in the budget. And the, it says, even with the addition of critical positions added in the last budget cycle, BCPS is woefully understaffed when compared to professional staffing guidelines for each profession listed below. And school psychologists, the suggested staffing was one for every 700 students, which seems inane to me. But our staffing at the time was one for every 1,191 students. So Mr. Offerman kind of got to the gist of my question. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you, I, am I correct to assume that your office and your role would be more effective if you were more adequately staffed? Absolutely, absolutely. I am humbled and um, just grateful for the community that I have because they are a, a community of professionals who do everything they can to, to help their colleagues to help students. So they try their best to you know contribute professionally and take up these cases, but they are taxed. They are taxed and they're doing it with so much grace. If we had more right. uh, positions, oh my gosh, we would be able to be so much more efficient in terms of the numbers and, and what they can do outside of the teams and the testing and, and really focus in more so on the SEL. But they're doing it now. It's just- Oh, no, I know they're doing it. I talked to a lot of them. Um, the reason I ask, I'm sure you're aware that board members play a critical role in the budget and we need to know what to ask for. So this has been, it's very timely and very helpful. Um, and again, I have personal experience with the role you play. I do have a practical question. By the way, I'm sure Dr. McComas is probably thinking, I cannot believe Frugal Mac is looking to spend more money. Um, but, you know, Miss Mac, I just have to say, I love you and I count on you to be who you are. So no worries. <laughs> I know. Uh, pick, yourself up, no Dr. McComas. <laughs> pick yourself up off the floor. Um, <laughs> I have a very practical question. Some, one of the speakers said, parents come to the birth to five or the child find assessment centers or the infant and toddler sites. But how do they know about you? If I'm an overwhelmed parent who just found out that my child has some type of delay or some type of diagnosed condition, how do I even know that you exist? Right, that's a really good question. Oftentimes um, parents are encouraged by the pediatrician to contact either the infant and toddler program okay. or the child find depending on their, the child's age. Um, you know, but I have said for years it would be so helpful if there were um, some public service announcements because we do often get referrals on children who are um, significantly delayed and they might be four or five. Clearly, that's a good time to start intervention, but clearly it would have been much better right. than 18 months, much younger. So well, the other reason I'm asking is um, Ms. Pasteur and I are on a board goals ad hoc committee, and one of the things that we're looking at is parent um, parent involvement and, and parent education. So I'm going to add this to the list of potential efforts for us moving forward. But again, I want to thank you for what you do. I want to thank you for the information and um, know that we have asked in the past and will continue to ask for additional staff so that you can do what you do so well. Thank you. Ms. Mack, um, this, yes. is, this is Dr. Adams. If it might be helpful, um, the Office of Special Education has a responsibility to actively engage in child find services, and we have always done so in conjunction with the Office of Psychological Services. And remember, at one point, the Office of Psychological, when I worked in the Office of Special Ed, Psychological Services was a part of the Office of Special Education, and so okay. I can I can certainly see us working together with Chief Dickerson um, and the Family and Community Engagement Office to see what we might be able to do to even further the promotion of child find. 
Great. Thank you very much. Because I think that's critical. I think I, I also volunteer at Johns Hopkins Hospital on infant and toddler surgical medical. And sometimes parents are so overwhelmed, they can't even deal with today, much less plan for tomorrow. And I think it's just critical that we let them know that resources are there. Um, we, we will help you through this. And sometimes I just don't think they know. But thank you very much. Ms. Mack, can I just speak to something that you said? I, I thank you for your questions um, about birth to five, but I just wanted to point out that when we submit or talk about FTE, birth to five isn't even a part of that. It's only those who are counted at the actual schools. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to highlight birth to five, because they do a tremendous amount of early intervention work, but aren't necessarily highlighted or spotlighted um, and, and counted when we're talking about these numbers. Those are That's a group of psychologists that isn't even counted when we're talking about the need for more, but we also need more there because we have our staff members pitching in to help um, contribute to those services. Thank you. I mean, that's important for us to hear. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. That is critical because it also, those numbers also give us a preview of the kinds of services we're going to need, you know, beyond that. Um, when I served on the Kerwin Funding Committee, we talked at length about this, about this need. And once again, um, it was cut, or the numbers cut down. And But everyone agrees straight across the state that there is a shortage, but a greater need. The numbers keep going down and the need keep getting larger. So again, thank you very much. Um, just great, thank you. And thank you for the work that you do, really. And Ms. Mack and Ms. Off, Mr. Offman and I just have to beat that drum a little louder, I guess. Mm -hmm. We just have to keep speaking truth until people really not are just hearing us, they hear us, they're just not listening. Okay. So. We'll do that. Thank you. Dr. McComas. Yeah, so I just want to uh, thank uh, the, our colleagues from um, the Office of School Psychology and Dr. Nieves and Dr. Zarchin for joining us today. We love to provide um, informative uh, presentations for our board members so that they really are well-versed and informed in the depth and breadth of all we do for our children. So we hope to see you back. Um, at some point, and I'm glad to know that it was helpful for our board members as we move closer to the budget uh, process uh, this season. So, and perhaps we should have them all the time because we are really ending the most prompt we've ever ended. So um, I just want to, as always. <laughs> I beg your pardon. One time you weren't here and we actually had three minutes to spare. Yes, ma'am. I have what no doubt I am the problem. I'm sure I am the problem. But I, um, I just genuinely want to say thank you. I hope that we did a fair job today of addressing all your questions and your concerns on whatever topic was on the agenda. I, as always, look forward to our next uh, committee. I did um, send a little invite so I can do a quick demonstration for any of our board members who want to see how to access the public website where all the resources are posted. So if you look in your calendars, I can do that very quickly. Uh, for all of you, so you you get this the technical demonstration. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I just thank I want to thank our school psychologist, Dr. Bennett. We're extremely proud of your work, and I think everybody sees why now. So great job, and happy School Psychologist Week. Thank you. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. Oh, and happy <laughs> happy Turkey Day this later. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Zarchin. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. a motion to adjourn. I believe that's it. I'm not looking at the... So um, moved, Mac. Um, can I get a second? Where is this? Just second it, Cheryl. All right, I'm going to second it myself. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.